So good morning, everyone, and welcome to Business Behind the Scenes. I'm Brenda Lewis, Senior Member Relations Manager here at the Tulsa Regional Chamber, and I'm pleased to welcome you all today. Before we get started, I'd like to uh, recognize our generous sponsors who make events like this possible. Oh, pardon me. My little notes here. Our Business Behind the Scenes sponsors are Exceptional Leaders Lab and M&M Lumber. Our small business benefactors are Exceptional Leaders Lab, Security Bank, Southwestern Payroll, and Web Branding. And our small business supporting sponsors are Integrated Business Technologies and TEDC Creative Capital. Again, I'd like to thank these sponsors for their generous support. We're thrilled to have Mike Bosch, co-owner of Andalini's Pizzeria with us today. Mike and his brother, Jim, opened Andalini's in 2005. Today, Andalini's has locations across Northeast Oklahoma in Tulsa, Broken Arrow, Jinx, and Owasso. They also have an Andalini Slice location in downtown, thank goodness for us, uh, in downtown Tulsa, and a location at Mother Road Markets and a food truck. Andalini's has played a pivotal role in revitalizing neighborhoods such as Jinx Riverwalk, Broken Arrow's Rose District, and Cherry Street. Mike, I'll now pass it over to you. All right, hello everyone. Okay, this is a speech and everyone's sitting at home. It's a very abnormal situation. So I have no precursor to how to do this. So I'm gonna do something a little bit different today. To those of you who are not uh, hiding behind the, the benefit of Zoom or driving, I'm gonna ask that you stand up and stretch for half a minute with me. So if you would be so kind as to break the normalcy of your Zoom protection shell and stand up, I know there's a lot to ask of someone, and just stretch out and be normal and act like we're not in a cosmic bubble for half a minute. Because that's what we would do. You would stretch, you would go into a room. Oh, hi, nice to meet you. Oh, there's that thing. Let's talk about sports teams. What sports teams? None exist right now. Oh, that's what I forgot. So that's what we do normally. We're not doing that today. So I'm gonna try and bring back some normalcy. You can feel free to sit down whenever you'd like. You could turn your, your, your view on or not, your call. Last night, Jimmy Fallon on The Tonight Show, one of the oldest uh, institutions in television, went back to the studio. It was not like normal, but it was not him at home anymore. It was a mix between the two. That is what I'm going to hope to achieve today. So I'm gonna give a speech as if I was standing on a stage and you were in a, a very uncomfortable, less comfortable than your ergonomic chair in your office, looking at someone with all the benefit of not wearing pants. So that's what I'm going to attempt to do today. All right, Andalini's. We started in 2005 in Owasso, the redheaded stepchild of Tulsa, around 15 miles north of, Owa of Tulsa, where I would say, oh yeah, I own a pizzeria. Where is it? Oh, it's in Owasso. I'm never gonna try that. Why? It's only 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes max from Tulsa. That's cute, that's adorable. I'm never going up to Owasso. I have no reason to go to Owasso at all. That's what it was like opening in Owasso. Now we opened in Owasso because my brother was vice president of Alamo Rent-A-Car and got transferred here with Kathy Taylor and Bill Lobeck in 2004. I had just graduated college and came here instead of going to law school on a whim. And I didn't drive halfway across America to suck at something. So I decided to learn how to be good at making pizza. I was good-ish. I put it this way. I don't advise giving a 22-year-old the reins to a restaurant based upon one year working a pizzeria and three years working at fine dining. It's not a good setup. It's not smart. But I just plugged away. And while my brother was at Alan Orenskar, we developed the brand and eventually opened on Cherry Street in 2011. In those six years, we screwed up a lot, quite a lot. And those screw ups made it so that when we opened our second store, we hit the ground running. A lot of people think that Cherry Street is our first store. It's not. It came together all at once with Cherry Street. Our brand developed for six years in Owasso. In that time in Owasso, out the gate, I figured, well, we should really have dough, sauce, and cheese that we take a lot of pride in. It wasn't that great. 
and what I knew about dough and, and pizza was pretty rudimentary. We also thought, well, we'll, we see a lot of other restaurants that have frozen ravioli and a lot of frozen um, items that they deep fry and it, it makes a lot of sense. It makes money. We're here to make money. Let's do that. I quickly learned when I had a really popular ravioli, a spinach artichoke ravioli that I purchased and another chain Italian restaurant that has closed uh, in the last 15 years, but they went and bought the same ravioli. Now, this was a special order item to me, and I thought that meant it was special. It wasn't. Anyone could buy it. When we had this frozen ravioli, and someone else had a frozen ravioli, it dawned on me that we were both selling McNuggets and claiming outside our restaurant that we were at McDonald's. So I decided we would take away the freezer, and we wouldn't do anything unless we made it ourselves. That the harsh realization, especially in a restaurant, but it applies to all business, is that if you're not impressive, by default, you're unimpressive. So that's a hard pill to swallow. If you're not impressive, if it's not, oh, wow, did you see that? It's just nothing. It's, it's unimpressive. Take your right leg, for example. Is your right leg impressive? More likely than I'm going to assume for most of you, it's not and it, you haven't thought about your right leg today. You haven't thanked your right leg today. You haven't glorified your right leg today. Nonetheless, your right leg is the one that's gonna push the gas pedal every time you get in the car. It's what you depend on. It's always there, but it does what it's supposed to do. And it's not dissimilar or any specialer than any other right leg out there. Nonetheless, we depend on it. So when people do what they're expected to do, some people think, hey, come on, give me some appreciation. Look, I did everything that was expected of me. So I'm killing it, right? And the truth is you're not. You're just the right leg. You did what the right leg's supposed to do. Thankfully, you're not a broken right leg, but you're not a special right leg either. So a lot of times when people go to a restaurant and they get the waters on time, they put it in order. The food comes out on time. Is it the best food they've ever had in their lives? Certainly not. Is it the worst? No. But when they finish the meal and they go to their car, They'll say, oh, that was okay. Yeah, it was fine. And then what happens is this. A family member or a friend says, hey, I just went to blank restaurant uh, or I want to go to blank restaurant next week. Would you like to come with us? And they say, no, we went last week. Oh, you don't want to go back? It was fine, but let's go somewhere else. That is just as bad as if it was the worst meal I've ever had in my life. I will never go back. Because in both scenarios, they're not coming back. One, they're not coming back because it was fine. And one, they're not coming back because it was horrible. In fact, I prefer the horrible story. If they're like, oh my God, it was the worst thing ever. The owner came out and threw a plate on the wall and cursed at us and kicked us out. I would say, I need to see that dumpster fire. I want to go to that horrible restaurant for the entertainment value. But in the blah restaurant, the, yeah, it was okay. It was okay. Well, I mean, in that world, everything sucks. And that is just as bad as being horrible because you're unimpressive. So I've learned the very hard lesson through owning a restaurant that if you're not impressive, you're unimpressive. So everything, everything has to be special. The ambiance, the product, or in our case, food, and then the service. This applies to all business I've noticed, whether or not it's even Amazon. Amazon, the product, what's the product? Everything. What's the service that it's available? It comes to your house very quickly. And what's the ambiance? A website that you've seen before and trust. These are the three elements, again, of every business. If you're selling widgets, the service, do they know you? Do they call you ahead? Do they know your birthday? Do they build rapport? Service. The product, is it what it's supposed to be? Most of the time, you just hope that you sell a product that, that actually lives up to the promise. If it can go beyond that, then you have something that's special, potentially impressive. And then the ambiance, the brand, is it clean? Does it give the sense that this is a higher value item? While not, not giving someone purchase anxiety, purchase anxiety that this is too nice and it's probably costing me too much money. That depends on the brand. All these things I've learned in the last 15 years came together at Cherry Street. And then from there, we were able to do our next venture which in 2012, we opened a food truck. 
We did a food truck because many places would say, you should come out to a multi-syllable town that's more than four syllables. And we would say, we're never going to open there. So pretty much if it has more than four syllables in, in Oklahoma, we're not going there. Ala kala kui tapala idolica? No, that's probably not for us. But, but a food truck made that possible. And we would go out to many events and obviously concerts and special uh, donation causes and be a part of the scene. By 2013, we wanted to expand our brand. Now, during all that time, I had been going to Italy and competing internationally in pizza making. And in that competition schedule, I learned about other styles of pizza and really steel sharpening steel to see what else is there in the pizza world. And we learned about Napolitana pizza and also authentic gelato, which I had always known and seen, but didn't understand. So then we created the brand of STG, Specialty and Tradition Guaranteed. With this brand, we then created STG downtown, and that lifted up and did very well, but in a very segmented way. That was by 2014, we had created that. We had created a gelateria, and we had created a, a pizza restaurant that sold a very particular style of pizza. Andalini's, to many of you that don't know uh, any different is not New York style, not even any style. It's more Tulsa style than anything else because it's a mix of New York ingenuity, but with more California influence on the toppings. And then the flour is an Oklahoma flour. You will not see a, or taste a pizza that's like Andalini's anywhere else in America because it's when you bite it, it's a chewy soft dough with a lot of toppings that stands up for being a soft dough. This is a very rare combination. So I call it more a Tulsa style pizza. Even our eggplant Parmesan appetizer, it's an appetizer instead of an entree. Our garlic knots, they're deep fried instead of oven baked. So each thing we try to find a spin on something. STG is exactly what you would get in Naples or Rome. So we're off to the races with STG and then Broken Arrow was looking to revitalize the Rose District. The Rose District, Main Street, a Broken Arrow was coming on strong. Main Street Tavern was doing well. And we did a build out there and realized it's a lot easier to revitalize Main Streets rather than go into what our first location was, which is a strip mall. Now, I love our Awasa location, but it's been there since 2004 when we started it. And if you've never been to it, there's people who will still say, I know where the Chinese buffet is and I know where the subway is, but where are you? And my answer is I'm between those two things across the street from a Walmart. It's been there. It's gorgeous on the inside, but it's a, it's hard to make this strip mall style thing happen. Our brand has developed over the last 15 years that we've somewhat outgrown it and tried to modify it while still staying true to the Owasso community. And that's one of the struggles that happens when you're a growing business. Along with that, another growth struggle we had was our brand logo. Originally, when we opened, we were trying to appeal to 35 to 45 year olds with families, a kitschy, fun, family style restaurant where our logo had a, a guy drinking a beer and serving a pizza. Done with a, on Photoshop, not in Illustrator, which anyone who knows anything about graphic design means that it wasn't built in Vector and you couldn't even expand the logo. So many stupid things I can talk about that first year. We made our logo with a, a ribbon under Andalini's that was supposed to be the Italian flag. In all of our wisdom, we did it backwards. It was actually the Mexican flag, and it took us a year to figure that out. And because we printed it not in CMYK, which is a, a style of color printing, when it printed on certain printers, it was just a rainbow. So you saw Andalini's in a big font and a rainbow under it inexplicably in a ribbon. These are things you do when you're a 22 year old and you're kind of a dumbass opening a restaurant. But the key to business is how to learn from dumbass mistakes and grow from them. And that's what we did. No ego. To this day, we could be better. We are not the best. Every day, something's not perfect. What is that? I am not in love with my successes. I am dedicated to fixing our failures or lacklusters. And that is our constant struggle. And I think why it's why we're still viable 
as a restaurant and not just sitting on our laurels, again, 15 years deep into being what we are. So then from Broken Arrow, which was a very hard build out, it was arduous, but we finally got it open. And then we went into kind of hitting our stride where we opened Jenks Riverwalk simultaneously while opening the Mother Road Market and creating another gelateria on Cherry Street that would then produce our product for all our stores. And then by 2019, we had acquired the location to the uh, west of our Andalini's Cherry Street location. And at first we wanted to expand it to be just more space for Andalini's. What we found was that would take a lot of effort with the city because we'd have to sprinkler our whole site and we'd have to close down and do many different things. And it dawned on me that there was nothing on Cherry Street that was really fulfilling a female demographic or a, a high-end Italian wine concept. There was a lot of beer. There was Kilkenny's for beer, Roosevelt's for beer, Andalini's for beer. There wasn't anything that was very well lit. So we created Prossimo Restaurante. And again, with the brand struggle, because I had spent at that point 14 years deep becoming the pizza guy that everyone knew to go to when it came to things of pizza, I had to keep myself and my name and my face away from the opening brand and not make it known that it was anything that we were doing just to give it the benefit of being its own thing. So we created Prossimo Restaurante, let it be its own thing because otherwise it would have been, Hey, what kind of fancy pizza you got here at this place started by the Andalini's guys. We were able to avoid that and were named one of the best restaurants in Tulsa last year. So another thing that we had as an accolade that kind of came out of nowhere, we had won best pizza in Owasso in 2006, and that was a big deal. Then as the urban Tulsa and Tulsa world started doing nominations for awards, we would win best pizza in Oklahoma and Tulsa here and there, and, and always a great thing to see. And I, I, appreciate all the work that our staff had done. Then out of the blue in late 2018, a press release comes into my email from Google saying that TripAdvisor had announced the top 10 pizzerias in America based solely on reviews from TripAdvisor. And if you know anything about how TripAdvisor works, it's an aggregate algorithm based upon higher defined review status for people that are reviewing somewhere that they don't live. So if I am on a cruise ship and I'm in Anchorage, Alaska, and that's all they get is visitors, it's going to have a higher review ag aggregate. Same thing for New York, same thing for heavily touristy towns. And on that whole list was us. So we had so many five-star reviews that we were on this top 10 list for TripAdvisor. It was a massive coup. And in all of our great Andalini's wisdom, I told our staff, I'm like, look, we got this award. It's, this is going to be a big deal. And because we are all so too cool for school and in love with never being in love with ourselves, they were like, I think they spelled that wrong. It's all right. Okay, but I got to do this. Okay, thanks. I'll talk to you guys later. And then I said, no, no, you guys need to triple staff this weekend. This is going to be big. And a lot of them are like, it's just another award, right? It's good. We won. Yay. And I think that's, I'm very happy that that was our reaction. Nonetheless, we got our asses handed to us that weekend and created a whole nother wave of business for out of towners to come into town and then it became, how do we monetize this win without just putting a green banner across the whole restaurant and having that become our brand? It's a weird thing when you get an accolade, how much you take that accolade and define your brand around it or distance yourself from it. If you walk into any Andalini's, you don't see a bunch of the framed prints of Tulsa Magazine, Oklahoma Magazine, because I've seen that before and it's a little cliche. It takes away from the brand, I believe, when now the brand is what other people have said instead of you as the customer seeing it yourself. So we refrained from doing that, but it was a debate at the time about how far to go with it. And luckily now with online presence, we were able to make our online presence represent that more than what you have when you go inside a store. There's a, a pizzeria in Naples it's the third oldest pizzeria in the world. It's called Dal Mateo, which means by Matthew. The first pizzeria or the oldest one is called by Michael or Dal Michele. And at Dal Mateo, this gorgeous, amazing pizzeria, you get the menu out and you open it. And in the middle of the menu, it says, in 1997, President Bill Clinton visit 
uh, Don Mateo, they are still rolling deep 23 years later that Bill Clinton visited there while passing through. That's their claim to fame. I'm like, no, your claim to fame is that you're the third oldest pizzeria in the world, and you're amazing. They're like, no, but the Bill Clinton, hey, hey, look at this. Bill Clinton came and he ate the pizza. I'm always fascinated by the fascination with America and the rest of the world and our fascination with the rest of the world, especially Italy, because it's just they, they don't get it at all. And I don't want to do that with the TripAdvisor with. Nonetheless, we need to monetize it so our servers can make more money. So by that time, we're now, we created this, we created five brick and mortars, two gelaterias, a food truck, and then a fine dining restaurant along with two concepts at Mother Road Market, uh, Tulsa's first food hall. At this food hall, we have Andalini Sliced, and then Metropolis, which is, again, our version of Italian street food, because most street food in America, your hot dogs, your Philly cheesesteaks, they all originated from the Italian area of town. So they are Italian in, in base nature. And we made Metropolis, Metropolis regional street food. And what we're so thankful to Kathy Taylor and the whole Lobeck Taylor Foundation was they've given this opportunity to young up and coming restaurants to try something out and to work out the kinks. So it took us six years in a full blown brick and mortar to learn. Now Tulsa's and the restaurant community has that head start that we are very thankful to be a part of and help other restaurateurs do and get their head start and see what's right, see what's wrong and get their advantage. Uh, I forgot to mention Andalini's, our Italian name. My Italian name is Carlucci, and it was already copyrighted by Joe Carlucci, who is actually now one of the guys I compete with internationally in pizza. So he's a good friend of mine. Nonetheless, in 2004, when we were deciding what our name would be, we said, well, I guess we can't use Carlucci because this Joe guy's using it. So what should we use? And we said, we got to come up with an A name. Why an A name? everyone over the age of 30, because the phone book mattered. The phone book mattered in 2004. It doesn't anymore. It doesn't at all, but the phone book mattered. So what we did was an A name. All right, uh, Al Dente. And then I was like, we don't sell a lot of pasta. And every Tom, Dick and Harry is going to walk in and say, is it Al Dente? What is it? it, it it's not quite Al Dente. And I said, I do not need that agita. So then we tried to go with another A name. And then I was watching Godfather 2 and Michael Corleone in Italy. His Italian name originally was Michael Andolini or Vito Corleone was Vito Andolini before he comes to America, which side note totally doesn't make sense because Corleone is a way harder name to say. So they said, oh, no, Vito Andolini is too hard. Where are you from? Corleone. Okay, Corleone's your last name. That doesn't make sense. Nonetheless. Vito Andolini, Andolini's became the name, and we said, let's just roll with that because it'll be at the front of the phone book, which mattered because of technology and the vast change of the last 15 years. And what I've learned and what we've learned is that to stay relevant, you can't just follow the trend. You have to find a way to lead them in your own path. So if I see stuff in New York and California that is advantageously at the forefront. I don't seek to just replicate it, but I do seek to do it in our own Tulsan way. Not Tulsonian, because we're better than Houston, but Tulsan way. And do it so that we can lead and that we can show the world in a very underdog Tulsan spirit what we have to bring to the table. Again, I'm not from here. I'm from New York and California, and I consider this home, and I don't want to live anywhere else in America. This is my adopted home because of that underdog spirit that I never knew I would resonate so much with that I felt all throughout my childhood at this town lives and breathes it. So to stay relevant, to go for not the next thing, but the next, next thing, social media isn't just, okay, I guess I'll do it or I'll hire someone to do our Instagram. It really is the thing that just is the lifeblood of all things communication now. And it's how we got through COVID by putting together a marketing campaign, which would normally be a three to six week endeavor within two hours for pizza kits. So you can make pizza at home while you're stuck at home was a photo, a social media post, an email blast, 
and a video while showing my staff how to do it and relying on integrated systems with Google Drive for the recipe, which occurred within one hour and 25 minutes so that we could not go quietly into the night that first week of COVID. And it's the sustaining fabric that I believe will hold us through into the coming future years. I say to my staff, we need to be like Regis Philbin. Regis Philbin is the most recorded man in the history of television. He's been on TV for a long time. And I still think he should have been on with uh, Kelly and Regis. I think he should have never left. I don't, I don't think it was a smart move to have him leave. But here he is in his late 80s on TV saying, I was just tweeting at Justin Bieber last night, and me and Joy went to, to the newest restaurant by Jose Andres, and it was fantastic. Here he is into his mid-80s, still going out to dinner with his wife, still trying to stay on the cutting edge of whatever pop culture was, not to writing it, not like I'll do this book grudgingly, riding that wave so he can still stay relevant. And the second someone says, oh, but come on, that Instagram is really not for me. Facebook, oh, that's what the kids can do, but that's really not my thing. You become a fifth grader looking down on fourth graders. Remember when you were in fifth grade and then the fourth graders came on the playground? You're like, back when I was in fourth grade, we used monkey bars. You guys with your swings all the time, it's, it's played out. I'm a monkey bar guy myself. That's stupid. And I see it a lot in business where people look down on the next wave instead of riding it with those people bringing it to the forefront. So that's our mainstay, staying relevant, creating amazing opportunities with amazing food, with people that dig what they do in an environment that's inviting, not trendy, but inviting, and an ambiance that supports all that with a product that people want to have an impressive experience. And I believe as long as we continue to do that, we will do just fine. So that is my 30 so minutes of our story on getting up to this point as a speech with a Zoom call, speaking at normal volume. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm glad I was muted because I was cracking up at the perfect moments you wanted us to be laughing. So thank you for, for the wonderful energy that you brought this morning. So I do have a few questions for you actually. So for someone thinking about starting a business, what makes the Tulsa region a unique place to start it? The number one headline, and I, I believe uh, even Mayor Bynum had said it, we revere entrepreneurship. We revere it. And I can tell you, living in Southern California, Northern California, New York, that does not exist anymore. It is not held in high regard. Doing your own thing is people have mixed reactions. Like, oh, you think you're better than me? Are you really going to do that? Or you're not going to go to a law firm? You're not going to do that? Tulsa reveres people who go out and are the adventurers, reveres the people who create. And that is a beautiful thing. And the, and the system, the systematic flow of what we do where it's very inviting to business and it's not this immense amount of fees and costs to open a business and that people are in your way. People want you to succeed here. And that's just not the case the rest of the world, especially not the rest of America. It's so true. It's so true. And I meant to mention this before I asked a question. Everyone, if you have questions, feel free to send them to Abby. Um, get them sent over to Mike. Okay, we had a question come in, Mike. So what was your backup plan if the pizza concept in Owasso failed? And why did you select Owasso for your first concept? Good question. So the first part of that, my, my grandpa and my dad moved out here, and my, my mom as well, uh, moved out here about six months after we opened. My grandpa had lived in New York all his life, a dock worker, uh, and a, a teamster who worked for Hoffa, and my dad, a 20-year Marine Lieutenant Colonel veteran, and they both said, what are you going to do after the restaurant? What are you going to do? Because they had seen restaurants up and close. They had been around restaurants their whole lives in New York. But what do you, what's, what's next? And I said, there is no next. This is it. Strap in. All these other people figured it out. We're figuring it out. There is no plan B, throw the life preservers away and get ready to swim with us. So that's 
that's the mentality that I think a lot of people who are entrepreneurs have to have. If you have your B plan, it becomes really convenient. I mean, I'll say my first year I had deferred my law school acceptance. So I was able to go back at any point and just go, okay, I failed. Uh, but my, I have a very angry Irish Italian spite that would not let that happen. So I say be angry and spiteful is the best, my best uh, advice. And then why Owasso? Because we started Alamo rent a car was at national, which is on Lakewood drive. And that's where my brother transferred to. It was, just, there wasn't much more thought than that. And there was an ice cream store that was not doing too great between a, a, a singular wireless and a buffet. And we said, how much do you want to leave? And it wasn't, my brother was able to take a portion of his bonus and they were happy to leave the strip mall. Wow. Wow. Um, I knew this event was happening today and I definitely had to go to research and grab one of those pre-made Angelini's pizzas. So I'm, so I'm getting hungry again though, as we talk about it. <laughs> um, another question actually about food trucks. So would you suggest opening a food truck to other restaurant owners and what are the pros and the cons? A food truck in 2012 to 2016 was the hotness. And in Tulsa, especially, it still isn't so heavily regulated that you can't be successful. Nonetheless, like when Guthrie Green started, it was gangbusters. To be successful in a food truck, you need to operate it like it's a full 24-7 business, which is impossible when it rains. But you need to be prepared to be open at all times. So here's the beauty. You're not paying for toilet paper. Not paying for toilet paper. You're not paying for a lot of other random stuff that just kills your margin. But it rains and go home. So it's great for us because we had, a, if our staff got rained out, okay, go work the stores. If we need to make product, we make the product and then bring it on the truck. We cook it on the truck, but we got a commissary. So it's very, that's why you see very few pizza food trucks. It's because they don't have a mixer they don't have anything that they can't do all their prep there. So they have to buy a commissary, then they have a food truck, and it's just not enough margin to, to sustain it. So I think if you're an up-and-coming restaurateur with very little cash, you should go the way of food halls. Most food halls, Tulsa being one, but most of them have a program, uh, a startup build-up program. It's a much better way to screw up and get your crap out of the way as you learn your, your trade. Got it. And um, we have someone ac actually asking, how did you develop your marketing plan? Marketing, I mean, I, I'm a poli-sci major, and I think I could open a marketing firm at this point if I wanted to. Not that I'm, I'm not being braggy, but you just have to learn so much about marketing. People don't expect to be marketed to when it comes to a burger. They expect a high level of marketing acumen when it comes to pizza. You deliver it this fast, this many, buy one, get one, all this kind of stuff. So I read every pizza book that there was. I would go to a pizza expo, which was a big turning point for me in 2006. I went to this expo in, in Vegas that 15,000 people go to. And I just listened to every single seminar. Again, not having an ego. Like, what does this guy do? What does this guy do? What does this guy do? And now I'm paid to go and speak at that. So it's a nice 180 on life that I get to go for free and still learn from others. But the marketing side of pizza is very, very nuanced, very aggressive. And all the marketing in it, just little things like a door hanger, a door hanger, very popular in the early mid 2000s. People would say, okay, if I have 10,000 of them, I should go to 10,000 houses. Little marketing nuance was no, go to 2000 houses five times and you'll get more return. And learning those little tricks which apply, same theory applies right to Facebook. Okay, target this person multiple times with a Facebook blast instead of just trying to get 50,000 people to see your stuff once. So that's where I learned a lot of my stuff. That's so interesting how, so specific to pizza and how one thing works better for the other, but it seems like it's a balance of the digital platform and also having the, the ability to send items to people so that they can physically see it. You blast them in different ways. Yes. <laughs> and I just love marketing. I love marketing. I love packaging. Like when Lunchables came out when I was eight years old, my parents did not understand why I loved it. I was like, it's in a box and it's yellow and it's this box. And they're like, this is horrible garbage deli meat. 
I have nice deli meat that we'll put in a plastic <laughs> bag. I'm like, but it's, it's in a little box and I love it. So having things beautifully packaged, which Apple and so many companies now take so much pride in, I always have, didn't know that that was just kind of in my nature to like those types of things. Yes, I'm the same way. So we have a question actually about another location. So have you ever considered opening a location in other cities like some of Tulsa's other popular restaurant brands? There, I mean, there's a pro and a con to all that. There's the pro of going to another city is it's a new demographic to start on with. But well, we've created a network. Right now, if Broken Arrow runs out of 14-inch boxes, I have three other stores that can fulfill that. If they're mm -hmm. down two people for staff, very inside baseball type stuff, but we have a very tight network that we've created. The problems with store one and store two don't exist nearly as bad with store three and store four. You're going back to store one if you go into another market. And as much as we all might know or like Andalini's, I am not so in love with myself to believe for one iota that if I go to Oklahoma City that people are, there's a few people that'll know us, but there's going to be a lot of people I never heard you. I don't know what that is. And you got to start from scratch, which is fine, but a restaurant is nothing to shake a stick at. It is not just a given. Restaurants that are restaurant brands that are popular in Arizona, and then they open up in Tulsa, they die quick. There's restaurants that have 15 locations in Dallas and can't sustain one in Tulsa. It's not an easy proposition to just up and start somewhere else. You've got to have people fully dedicated to the brand, really seeking to be impressive because you can't be, well, we're our brand and this is the food. So great. Why would you not love us? It? It's not like that. It's like a comedian going on stage. You could have the, one of the biggest names in comedy. He gets on stage, people clap. They're like, okay, great. After 90 seconds, make with the funny or else I'm going to hate you. Right. Right. Um, so uh, another question here, what advice would you give someone who is wanting to start? Oh, sorry. I think I already asked that question. Did I, get, I don't think I asked that question. What advice would you give someone um, that who's wanting to start a business, a small business in Tulsa and or the surrounding areas? I think getting with the chamber obviously makes a lot of sense. Learning what is out there, going to someone who's doing something very akin to what you do and working there if you don't already know this business inside and out. So starting from the ground up to see what they do and you could be coy about it or be out in the open. I'm trying to learn how to do this business so that you learn the vendors, learn the inside thing. And I believe very much that someone who opens a business needs to be confident, but they can't be cocky and they can never be egotistical. So confident is I can do this. I, I know I can have the willpower cocky is, I'm going to be easy to bang this out and it won't be anything. And ego is I'll be the greatest person to ever do it in the history of the game. No problem. You got to stick with confidence, but the other two are very perilous. So you mentioned the chamber and I actually was curious because I've been here two years. And so I wasn't here for when you first started with us, but what was your involvement with the chamber personally and professionally? And how did that help you? I know you kind of touched on that a little bit. I think, well, starting with the, in Owasso, with the Owasso Chamber and meeting businesses and going and just shaking hands and saying, again, every single person you meet is a lottery ticket. You, they, it potentially is going to lead to something. If you never buy a lottery ticket, you can't win the lottery. So networking in that sense is one big thing. But then also being able to say, hey, I don't know where to go for this tax code. I don't know how a, when to do a business license versus an alcohol license and how they relate to each other. The, in this state, this state is the most put together state I've ever been in. But when it comes to licensing, it's not super expensive, but it's very hard to navigate because you have to get one before another, but then that one leads to that one. And in a very weird order, especially for restaurants, that part we could stand to be better on. And the tax code also is, I, I have no problem saying this to anyone listening. The taxes in the state are not the price is fine. The way it's run is so antiquated that it's a nightmare for any small business to try and figure out. And that's something we definitely need to work on as a state is, okay, I, how do I know when to pay my taxes for this day versus this day? We as a company overpay our taxes every month just so that we're never in with a company or a business that's so hard to understand and work with, not a business, but a government entity rather. 
Wow. Um, Mike, so much of your success has been based on your innovation and grit. And so is there an external factor or something Tulsa could do that would be a game changer for your business? Uh, Mr. Elon hanging out, bringing his posse down to hang at the pizza parlor. That would be pretty sweet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, more, we, we are on the precipice right now. Everyone knows here how great it is. The rest of the world is getting clued in here and there. Anyone that's ever been to Tulsa always says, I've never had a bad night in Tulsa. It's just, we're right at that. Austin, Austin was this weirdo thing in 98 and no one thought about it. And we're there without the absolute drudgery of traffic and without the uh, overconfidence or cockiness that Austin has. We're right on the precipice. We just need one massive business to take us over to the top. We get a, a, a sports team here and a bunch more people operating here. And we're not, we go from a tier three to a tier two city like that. That's all it's going to take. It's those two things, sports team and a massive business, another massive business making their home here. Right. All right. Now I have to ask you uh, something on your menu. What is the most popular item on your menu? Or, and, or is there an underrated item on the menu? There, there's another lesson I learned when I was, I tried to make this menu at, at a law so that was like, Hey, if we can make it, we're putting on there. We want to have as many lottery tickets and that lottery ticket theory does not work in a menu on a menu. It needs to be all killer, no filler. It's less it's impressive. It's not on the menu. So we did that wrong. And what we did when I said, let's just make the end all be all of a cheese pizza. Let's get the best San Marzano tomatoes from Italy that we verify are actually San Marzano tomatoes and not dirty liar mafia tomatoes that are actually from Asia. That's the thing. There's dirty liar mafia tomatoes that are called San Marzano tomatoes. So when you go to Whole Foods, that's not from Italy. Side note. So we got the real tomatoes and then we made the mozzarella and then we got fresh basil. We had extra virgin olive oil, pecorino romano put on the pizza before and after to bake and then olive oil at the table. And that is our DeMarco of Brooklyn done in the style of a pizza that I grew up around, but our spin on it. And it's so perfectly simple that if you never, I always go to a Mexican restaurant, I get a bean cheese and rice burrito. Cause if you can't get that right, I'm not, you gotta play Mary had a little lamb before we're doing stairway to heaven. So that's what I like. And that's what I believe anyone who comes to our restaurant should try. We just relaunched and re brought out the most opulent item I've ever had on our menu. We brought back last week and it is the Detroit pan bread. It is three twists of dough with a lot of butter, a lot of garlic, and then mozzarella baked in a pan, a, a Detroit style pan where the cheese burns on the crust. And it's just a glob of cheese and bread. And if you can't get that right, then life was just going to not make sense to you because that is perfect. So that is my most happiest thing to eat. It is decadent. You can't screw it up. It's cheese and bread there eat eat with your face <laughs> so that's what i would suggest if you're debating what to have that would be it or and the, the more nuanced finer fare again that's like just down home like eat this prosimo has my favorite items with our fresh mozzarella made at the table our uh alfredo made at the table in a parmesan reggiano wheel with brandy on fire in front of you it's incredible the uh orichette. Uh, it's a little spicy. There's a lot of nuanced things that actually do have some level of culinary expertise, but straight up pizza are those two. I said I was hungry earlier. Now I'm really hungry. And I just had your pizza yesterday. I also bought the margarita pizza that's now being sold um, at Reese's, which I had at Reese's. Yeah. So that's one Very of my cool. pizzas. <laughs> okay, our last question. Lots of advice that we love to get from you. Do you have any advice for young business owners just starting their business? I, yes, and I believe that a lot, of, a lot of people that were born in the 70s or 80s were kind of derided that you couldn't do it. Or yeah, you could do it, but it's probably not the smartest thing. I think there's a lot of people that just assume that the world is waiting for them to do something and that it's gonna be a free ride. And 
it's going to take doing something in a very unique and different way to be able to stand out and to be impressive. And the grit that it's going to take is, is not in high, high amounts anymore. So really applying yourself, not just digitally, but and putting in the man hours. Because as much as people over the age of 35 will deride younger people, younger people deriding older people and not getting face time and not putting themselves out there and are very much in their shell. I think the ability to carry conversation, the ability to speak in public, the ability to empathize is, is slowly deteriorating with so much connectivity, but not so much nuanced conversation. So to endear yourself to people that are older, you have to have that level of conversational ability. There was a time with people that are in their now 65 and plus, where it was, you wait when, until uh, all the females had gone into the elevator before you would go in and you wore a hat and all these very old Mad Men-esque things that don't exist anymore. But if you had your game tight in your, and you were 20, 20 years ago, you knew that you had to play that game to those guys who were the, the key holders in their 50s and say, yes, sir, thank you, sir. All those kinds of things that slowly have changed. And social norms will change, but I'd say the key of being successful as a young person is to understand your social norms, the next generation social norms, and even two generations away social norms, and playing in between all of them to be a success. You could not have said that better, you know, and not be, it's not a hurtful thing, you know, it's just a matter of fact, and things that I've noticed in my generation that I feel very disappointed about. Um, but Mike, thank you so, so much for taking time this morning to share your story with us and, and talk to us. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. And a special thank you to our generous sponsors. I'd also like to thank Jerry Barrientos and the Small Business Connections Program and Events Committees for making today's event possible. At this time, I'm going to need everyone's help. And I'd like to ask you to take the following survey question about today's event. And you're going to see a little poll pop up on a scale of one to 10, one being the lowest and 10 being the best. How did today's event meet your expectations? Again, one is the lowest, 10 is the best. Your feedback, actually, it helps us shape future connection programming. So thank you, thank you in advance for your participation. And I'll give you all some time to, um, to answer that. And um, Abby, I'll wait for your cue. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. If you found today's event valuable and would like to help us ensure we can continue to bring informational programs like this to you, please consider making a donation to support our mission. A donation form is available at tulsachamber.com slash support our mission. So again, tulsachamber.com slash support our mission. Tomorrow, The Connection is hosting a virtual C-level lunch event, which places business owners in small groups to share advice and build relationships. You can register for this event and all of the Chamber's upcoming events at tulsachamber.com slash events. Again, tulsachamber.com slash events. If the Chamber can be of assistance to you during this time, please, please reach out to us. Thank you so much again, and I hope that you all have a wonderful day.